Hello students, today the topic of the lecture is diagnosis and treatment planning in endodontics. So as previously described, what is endodontics? It basically deals with the study of the pulp which is present within the tooth. Endo is within, dontic is tooth. So it is a branch of clinical dentistry that is concerned with the prevention, diagnosis and treatment of diseases of the dental pulp and their sequelae. So what do we try to do in endodontics is basically preserve the tooth. We shall try our best preserve the vitality of the tooth in the first go. That is by a restore by restoration of the tooth. If the vitality is questioned, then at least we have to preserve and restore the tooth which is irreversibly inflamed and or necrosed. That is either by pulpectomy that is in other words root canal treatment. If this treatment also fails, then we re-attempt to do an endodontic treatment again, which is nothing but endodontic retreatment or do a periapical surgery. Ultimately, the aim or the scope of endodontics is to preserve the tooth at whatever cost. So coming to diagnosis and treatment planning. So all of you would have seen this jigsaw puzzle that, uh, which we have been solving since our childhood days. So you know that all the pieces are equally important to solve the puzzle. So a single missing piece would not solve the puzzle. So it's understood. Similarly, uh, this can be compared to diagnosis. So if you have to diagnose the condition of the patient, that is come to a conclusion with what is wrong with the patient, you should collect pieces of information and all those pieces of information should be systematically gathered to provide as a diagnosis. So not to miss any single piece of information. So diagnosis is defined as the correct determination, discriminative estimation and logical appraisal of conditions found during examination as evidenced by distinctive marks, signs that are characteristic of health or disease. Don't worry. In simple words, it just means you have to correctly determine, differentiate between different conditions. Also look for the different signs, distinctive marks which indicate health or look for the characteristic mark signs which indicate the disease. You should be able to differentiate what is normal and what is different from the normal or which what is a characteristic of the disease. For example, the dental caries which is involved only the enamel of the tooth. So in simple words, it is just reversible pulpitis. So that is how you have to look into the signs and come to your diagnosis. So diagnosis can be compared to a pyramid where the chief complaint, the medical history, the dental history and the patient interaction form the foundation. As you go step by step to the, towards the apex of the pyramid, you, attain, you conclude the diagnosis and then plan the treatment. So, all of you know that you have been taking case histories in many specialty departments. So, you know that in medical history, we make a note of the medical conditions of the patient, his medications, if he is taking any or his history of recent surgery, etc. And the dental history is to know, uh, to have an idea about his uh, awareness towards dentistry, if he had any undue experiences in the past or if he had got any treatments done in the past etc. So all this gives us the both the medical and dental history gives us the general idea of the general health of the patient. The next most important part of the case history is the recording of the chief complaint. As you all know the chief complaint should be written in the patient's own words. It should not be interpreted in our language. So the chief complaint gives us a main idea of the diagnosis. It is a leading way towards the diagnosis. After writing down the chief complaint, we have to always elaborate on the chief complaint. That is the history of present illness. So we take down or we ask the patient how long, since how long the, he has been suffering from this pain, that is the duration of the pain. How long uh, does he suffer? That is when there is a stimulus does the pain subside immediately or does it linger even after the stimulus is removed? 
what are the different symptoms, where the location, that is, is it generalized or localized, the onset, does it spontaneously start or it starts only when there is some exposure to the stimulus, are there any relieving factors or if the patient has some referred pain or if he is taking any medications. All these leading questions help us to towards, the, towards the way to diagnosis. So this itself gives us 50% idea of what the diagnosis could be. So you have already studied in pulpal pathology that when in a reversible pulpitis, the duration of pain is short-lived. That is, we test it with a heat or a cold test and where the patient uh, immediately has a relief as soon as we remove the stimulus. But even sometimes the patient have lingering pain even after we remove the stimulus, that which uh, indicates irreversible pulpitis. So the chief complaint or the uh, elaborative questions on the pain itself gives us a 50% idea about the diagnosis. So we always have to have some patients and take a detailed history of the pain. The next most important is the clinical examination. As you all know, we always examine the patient first extra orally, that is his general appearance, his gait, the, any, if there are any swellings, discoloration, redness, any uh, star scars or extra sinus openings sinuses then or lymphadenopathy. Then intraorally, first we have to have a look on the soft tissues, that is the lips, oral mucosa, cheeks, tongue, periodontium, palate, and the muscles. Next, we see look into the jaw bones and finally the teeth. All this not to be missed. It does not mean because the patient complains that he has pain in 3.8, we jump onto the tooth of 3, into the, looking into 3.8 only. We always have to have uh, have an examination, a thorough examination of extraoral structures and the intraoral structures. So next after that, that is after taking a detailed chief complaint, his medical dental history, then examine the patient extraorally, intraorally, then we have few clinical tests, important tests, which help us to diagnose the pulpal and the periapical diseases. These tests can be classified as pulp tests and the periapical tests. The pulp test tell us indicate the status of the pulp and the periapical test indicate the status of the periodontal ligament. So the cold test, the electric pulp test and the heat test. The cold test and the heat test are together called as thermal test and the periapical tests are, periapical tests are nothing but the percussion, palpation and the tooth slot. So coming to one by one. Now all these tests together, that is the pulp test which I have mentioned, the heat test, the cold test, the thermal test and the electric pulp test are together called as tests of sensibility. Why is it named is because they basically respond, the response what we get from the patient is because of the neural supply. That is these A delta fibers which are peripherally placed in the pulp and the C fibers which are centrally placed. So because these tests depend on the response of the nerves this is called these are called the tests of sensibility okay these are not called vitality vitality is testing the blood supply of the tooth so what are the tests which test the vitality will i'll be further telling you now so coming first to the cold test the cold test is basically done either using a core air, cold air blast cold water bath the ethyl chloride spray sticks of ice, normal ice cubes, that is sticks of ice cubes or with a carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide, CO2 sticks. Now these CO2 sticks are almost outdated because they have a temperature of minus 78 degrees. So when suddenly, when placed on the tooth, sometimes the enamel may crack. That is, they say, it is termed as crazed lines may be seen or infarction lines. That is why this is no more used. So this can be the most simplest test but the uh, disadvantage of this ice cube is after when it starts melting these cold drops may sometimes fall in the opposing arch and the patient may feel sensitive. So instead of this tooth, this tooth may respond and we may take it as a false positive response. So the best method to test the to test to have a cold test is what we do in the department is use the ethyl chloride spray. So this is an ethyl chloride spray which is sprayed onto a cotton swab, a small swab and these vapors condense onto the swab and this is how it is tested. 
So when you touch the tip of the swab, you will see how cold it is. So then wait for the patient's response. Now coming to the heat test. This is usually again performed with a hot air, hot water, hot burnisher, hot gutta pacha or a hot compound or even polishing rubber cup can be used to test the heat test that is to perform the heat test. Now again this heat it is also a thermal test this response because of the neural supply the A delta fibers respond to this heat test. Now this is the hot gutta percha stick sorry gutta percha stick which is commonly used this is usually heated up to 66.5 degrees to have a response. Now a small video showing the same. The gutta percha is heated on the flame until it becomes slightly soft and placed on the tooth. In both the tests, even, uh, even the heat test, cold test or EPT, first we have to test the normal tooth and then place it on the tooth in which you have a doubt. Okay? Because first the patient has to understand what is a normal tooth. How does it respond on the normal tooth or even you should know how the patient responds when it is placed on a normal tooth only then you have so if the patient has complaint on one one then you should first check two one or two two rather and then one one and one two so that the patient can differentiate between the stimuli so this heat test and the cold test how do they respond when the patient does not respond to both this thermal test that means the pulp is non-vital. So when there is no response it means non-vital pulp it could be a necrosed pulp also. When the patient responds mild or to moderate degree of pain then that means and the pain subsides within one to two seconds after the stimulus is removed then it means it's a normal tooth. Okay. If the patient patient's response is strong and sudden as soon as you place it but again the pay it subsides as soon as you remove the GP or the eye stick then that means it is a reversible pulpitis only a restoration will do. If the response is moderate and too strong and this painful response lingers even after you remove the stimulus then it means a reversible pulpitis. So please note students what can what types of responses can we expect when we are doing thermal tests on the patient. It can be no response that means non-vital. It can be a mild response as in a normal tooth. It can be a strong momentary response which subsides it is reversible pulpitis. It can be strong response which lingers even after the removal then it is irreversible pulpitis. Then coming to another test. That is the electric pulp test which is also used to test the nervous neural supply of the pulp. So this also tests the sensory fibers. This electric pulp test should not be used on the patients with cardiac pacemakers. And again to, uh, to remind you that all these tests do not test do not give us any information about the vascular supply of the pulp which is actually the true determinant of the pulp vitality. Now how does this electric pulp test work? So this is how it is done usually a medium is placed which is uh, which acts as a um, that is sometimes a toothpaste or a LA gel is placed to, to for easy passage of current. In all the tests, don't, we should not forget to isolate the upper lip with cotton rolls. So how is the electric pulp test done? This is the electric pulp tester in the department which to complete the circuit, usually a lip clip is applied and then the, this tip is placed onto the tooth. So already a, tooth, a small amount of toothpaste is placed on the tooth which acts as a medium to suck for the current supply and this is how you get the readings. So, so the patient has responded at 11 that should be noted first the normal tooth is tested then the tooth in doubt is to be tested later and this is how one after the other we tested. So here 
in the EPT we have an advantage of noting it down that is at what stage did the patient respond so if the if the, all the teeth have responded at a reading of four five six and the tooth if the tooth another tooth which is in doubt responds at 15 or 16 that means it is a non-vital tooth or sometimes as you increase to 20 also the patient may not respond so it's a non-vital tooth or sometimes uh, if the normal tooth responds at 4 and 5 the other tooth responds somewhere around 8 and 9 and the, even after you remove the stimulus patient may have a lingering pain so again which indicates a reversible pulpitis so this is how the EPT helps us in recording it documenting it so these three tests uh, test the sensory stimulus of the pulp this is another test which is performed when the patient does not give us a proper response sometimes if is on medications like uh, sedatives or if the patient is an alcoholic sometimes these tests that is the thermal test and electric pulp test may not respond so sometimes if when we have to know whether that tooth goes for a root canal treatment or just a restoration is enough when the other tests have failed we do something called as the test cavity this is to be done as a last resort so this is done by drilling we take an erotor or a micromotor burrs and start drilling through the enamel and reach the dentine junction of unanesthetized tooth here we are not anesthetizing the tooth we want to know whether the tooth is vital or not so without and when the patient is not responding only then responding to when the patient is not responding to other thermal tests and the EPTs only then we use it as a last resort so we do not anesthetize the tooth here we start drilling the drilling through the enamel and reach the dentine even after reaching the DEJ that is dentine enamel junction if the patient does not complain of any sensitivity that means it is a non-vital tooth if the patient if the tooth is vital then the patient feels severe sensitivity at this junction so that means it is the pulp is vital so this is how the test cavity is used as a last resort then anesthetic test is also another test which uh, basically test the neural supply of the tooth which is performed when again when all the other tests have failed that here we anesthetize a single tooth one after the other by intraligamentary infiltration so when the patient is complaining pain in a lower jaw right jaw for example so you don't know which is the culprit so from either from the mesial aspect or the distal aspect we start anesthetizing one tooth after the other so first from the premolar four we do an intraligamentary injection patient is not relieved out of pain then five patient is not relieved then six when we inject do an intraligamentary injection the patient may be relieved with pain so that so six is the culprit this is how the anesthetic test help us in diagnosing which tooth is the culprit when we are not able to do it with the other tests